that we can start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on the second meeting, second lecture uh, of the series State Diversity and Security Studies on Interdependencies in Contemporary World. Well, uh, this is uh, the second meeting in truly, uh, truly, you know, devastating time. And what I would like to say is that our hearts goes out to all Ukrainian people. Stay safe and and be brave uh, in this uh, situation. So guys, as you already know, as you probably already know, uh, with this project, this uh, series of lectures, uh, we are trying actually to test and to expand our uh, scientific uh, cognitive horizons. Uh, thanks to world-renowned experts like our today's guest. And well, our today's meeting is actually going to test many things, um, especially our, you know, scientific mindsets, uh, let's say, uh, where we used to leave uh, very little space for things such as UFOs, such as uh, UAPs, and as well as uh, uh, in general for, for serious consideration uh, of the role of the, let's say, unexplained within the political process and political decisions. And our today's guest, uh, guest is going to prove it wrong. So let me uh, introduce uh, this uh, extremely likable and inspiring person uh, who you probably already know from uh, from the media, from television, from internet, uh, Mr. Nick Pope himself, uh, former official of the uh, UK Ministry of Defence, uh, well-known expert specialising in uh, UAPs and, and UFOs, an author, journalist and broadcaster. Uh, during his uh, duty for British Ministry of Defence, uh, Nick uh, worked in so-called uh, UFO desk, uh, where he was responsible for uh, investigating reports on UFO uh, sightings and verification if they have any significance for uh, national security. Uh, well, I have to say that Nick uh, seems to be, uh, you know, someone like uh, contemporary Major Garland Briggs from the Twin Peaks movie. Well, but I'm quite sure that he sees his role, uh, professional role, uh, quite differently. Uh, don't you, Nick? Yes, yes, I think so. <laughs> Guys, it's 7 a.m. in San Jose, California, so uh, so we really uh, we should really appreciate uh, Nick's uh, commitment. Uh, right, Nick, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and uh, I, I would like to obviously uh, thank you and thank everyone at the university for arranging today's meeting and indeed arranging the wider series of, of lectures that you are producing as part of this program. Because I think, um, and I speak particularly, of course, for today's event, it is important to look into areas that are perhaps traditionally ignored and ask some interesting questions. Uh, why are these areas so often ignored? And what interesting things have we missed by not looking at them, which we can now perhaps put under the spotlight? So with that out of the way, let me just uh, give a short personal overview of how I came to this, this subject. I, I'm, uh, as, as you heard in the introduction, I worked for the British government for 21 years at the Ministry of Defense. I was a civilian employee, and uh, the Ministry of Defense is, is an organization that has two main roles. It is a policy-making department of state, uh, self-evidently making defense policy, but it also serves in parallel as the United Kingdom's highest level military headquarters. So as I say, I was a civilian employee there. I did about eight jobs in the course of my 21 year career. And between 1991 and 1994, 
I was assigned to a division where my duties included researching and investigating the UFO phenomenon. Now, we, we use the term UFO and UAP interchangeably, unidentified flying object and unidentified aerial phenomena. You will hear the term UAP more often from within government, the military, and the intelligence agencies because we felt that the term UFO carried with it too much uh, pop culture baggage. When you say UFO, too many people thought of science fiction movies or conspiracy theories. So we wanted to rebrand the subject to make people look at it in a different way. And when I say make people look at it in a different way, I don't really mean the media and the public. I mean people within the Ministry of Defense when we wanted this taken more seriously. Because we did not look at this work, and this work has been variously called the UFO desk, the UFO program, the UFO project. All these terms are colloquial, uh, interchangeable. Uh, the real title of our work was uh, Secretariat Air Staff 2A, which is meaningless civil service um, jargon. So we, we colloquially called it the UFO desk. But the purpose of this work was not to search for alien life. The purpose of this work was simply to ask the question, is there something unidentified in British airspace? And if there is, what is it? And, and can we make efforts to identify it? And we had a joke, it, perhaps in the current circumstances, it is not particularly funny, but we, we used to say to ourselves that any UFOs are more likely to be Russian than Martian. And a lot of what we were looking at was, was asking the question, could any of this be secret prototype aircraft, missiles, drones being tested or operated by adversaries? So we did not go in expecting to find extraterrestrials, but neither did we rule out that possibility. We took no view on the subject at all. We simply decided that, that we would go where the data took us. So we received about two or 300 reports each year. We investigated them, and that includes interviewing the witness, uh, trying to corroborate the sighting in terms of the date, the time, the description, uh, corroborating it with military aircraft exercises, uh, satellite uh, overflights, weather balloon launches, uh, all the sorts of things that people misidentify. And, and call UFOs. So and we, we also looked at the radar data. Radar was a very important part of our investigations because eyewitness testimony is important, but if you have corroborative evidence, uh, such as when a military pilot sees something, but simultaneously it's tracked on radar, this elevates the case in our minds 
in terms of its importance. And another aspect of our investigation, which was very important, was the question of photographs and videos. And again, if we had uh, something like that, our intelligence community imagery analysts could uh, look at this in great detail and just as they would look at images from satellites or from reconnaissance aircraft, they could look at these UFO photographs and begin to make some, some calculations. Um, so this, this was why we were doing the job and how we did the job. And at the end of each year, most of these sightings could be explained as misidentifications and maybe a few hoaxes too. And in some of the cases, there was insufficient information to make a definitive assessment. And in a small proportion of cases, perhaps 5%, even after a detailed investigation, we could find no conventional cause for what was seen, uh, often in circumstances where the witnesses were pilots or police officers, military personnel, and where we had the sorts of corroborative evidence that I mentioned, like radar and, and photos and videos. And sometimes these objects seem to be capable of speeds and maneuvers, sudden accelerations, which seem to be significantly more advanced than, than our own aerospace technology. So this was very interesting to us. We, of course, did not say this is proof of extraterrestrials, but as I mentioned, neither did we ever rule out that possibility. So with that personal background out of the way, I want to bring us forward in time to December the 16th, 2017, which is the day that this subject moved out of the fringe and into the mainstream because this was the day on which the New York Times here in the United States, where I now live, put on their front page a story about UFOs. And there were two parts to the story. In fact, there were two separate stories. The first was that although the United States government had for many years denied investigating UFOs, they said they had no program um, and they had not had a program since the end of the 1960s when the Air Force had a program called Project Blue Book. But more recently, the United States government said, they, there is no program. We are not investigating. The New York Times discovered evidence that there was a program. And when they confronted the Department of Defense with this evidence, the Department of Defense said, yes, we have this program called ATIP which stands for Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. It was a very clever title because it didn't even mention UFOs or UAPs at all. It sounded as if it was all about uh, Russia and China and future aerospace technology, but the reality was different. And in parallel with this revelation about this program called ATIP, 
it was revealed that the United States Navy had video films taken from uh, Navy jet, jet aircraft showing UFOs. And I'm sure you have seen some of these videos. They, they are quite well known. One of them has been called the Tic Tac. Um, but again, several things are important about these videos. We always knew that pilots had seen UFOs, but it was another dimension to the story to have the United States government admit that these videos were genuine and then later put these three videos on their own website and say, yes, these videos are genuine. And no, we still don't know what these objects are. But that's precisely what happened. So all the people who had previously treated this subject as science fiction, as crazy conspiracy talk, they suddenly were confronted with this situation where it was on the front page of all the major newspapers in the United States, the serious newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Um, it was quickly picked up by the major television broadcasting networks um, all around the world, not just the United States, but Europe, uh, the BBC ran the story, many, many others. And so people said to them, but themselves, they, they asked, they said, we, we were told that this was just crazy talk, but now we find that the government and the military are taking this seriously. So several things happened very rapidly after this story was revealed. Um, one thing that happened was that the United States Navy, who were at the center of many of these UFO encounters, produced guidelines to their pilots telling them what to do if they encountered these objects. And the Navy confirmed that, that these guidelines existed and had been issued to their, their personnel. But of course, they did not reveal exactly what these instructions said because the information is classified. Another thing that happened uh, was that, oh, and I, I should mention that when this story was revealed, uh, some of the pilots, some of the radar operators, and some of the intelligence community personnel involved in the investigation uh, spoke to the media about this. Um, and there was a, quite a famous quote from one of the Navy pilots who had seen this UFO. And he said, uh, his name is Commander David Fravor. And he said, I do not know what we saw. And then he smiled and he said, but I want to fly one. So the message was clear. And if you have seen these videos, you can listen to the pilots and you can hear their excitement as they are filming these objects. Uh, these, these men and women are the elite within the US military. They, they call them the top guns, like in the movie with Tom Cruise. So these people are not easily impressed because they themselves fly 
the cutting edge of aviation technology. So when they encounter something faster than, than them and more maneuverable, they get very excited. And you can hear that on the soundtrack to uh, two of the three videos have, have sound that has been released. So you can get a sense of even these elite pilots being very impressed. This is something unusual that they are encountering here. So after they had issued instructions to the pilots, the United States government then set up a new organization called the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force. And this task force started to investigate some of the data. Um, this is a story that goes back maybe 80 years, some people say longer than that, but uh, they could not look at every UFO story ever reported. So they decided to start with 2004 and the, the incident on one of these films where, where the, the pilot, David Fravor, encountered this white oval shaped object that has been called the Tic Tac. At one point, this object was apparently under the ocean. And at another point, it was in the sky. And some of the calculations about the acceleration are, are extraordinary. Uh, this, this has not been officially confirmed, but some scientists with access to the raw data have made a calculation about a top speed of 80,000 miles an hour. Uh, to me, this, this seems incredible. And, and as I say, it is not officially confirmed, but, but this is why we need people taking this more seriously. And um, one of the themes, I think, of, of this talk is that this is now a subject that is taken more seriously. And, and many of you will know, for example, the work of the Harvard astrophysics professor, Avi Loeb, who has uh, started an organization called the Galileo Project, which will look not only for interstellar objects like Oumuamua, uh, but we'll also look at some UAP data. So this is a very refreshing development that now we have astrophysicists like Professor Avi Loeb prepared to look at this, this subject. Uh, we have the United States government prepared now to look at this subject. And this brings me to the political aspects of this, because, uh, of course, everything, everything in life is politics. And um, it will not surprise you to learn that one of the first things that happened after it was revealed that these videos existed, uh, that the Pentagon had the ATIP program. A lot of people in the United States Congress got quite angry with the government. And they said, you told us you had no program. Now, normally, even with classified programs, in the United States government, in any democratic society, there should be a degree of uh, accountability. These programs, even the classified programs, um, somebody has to 
account for the money and make sure the money spent on these programs is being spent properly in the way that parliament uh, in, in the United Kingdom, but, but Congress in the United States um, wanted this money to be spent. So if, if, you, if you have a program for a new fighter jet aircraft, the Department of Defense can't take that money and build some new ships because that is not the intention. That is not what that money was programmed for. So not only do you have to build the aircraft and not the ship, but you have to account to the people on the oversight committees that you are building the aircraft to the correct specifications. And of course, not everything goes to plan. So throughout any program, the, the people in Congress, in Parliament, whatever the body is, will be holding the military and the Department of Defense properly to account and making sure that, that the correct outputs are delivered. So of course they said, we did not even know about this program. So how could we ensure that the money was being properly spent on defense business? And how can we assess whether you are achieving your goals with this program? So in the United States Congress, uh, several different committees became involved in the UFO question. Uh, it, the United States Congress has two parts, the Senate and the House of uh, the House of Representatives. So the intelligence committees became involved. Uh, the armed services committees became involved and the appropriations committees became involved too, um, to do with the money. And at first, these people, as I say, were quite angry because they said, you hid this program from us. And everybody understands that with some classified programs, um, not all the information will be revealed, but people within Congress can and do have top secret clearances, security clearances. So there are people who are able to see this, this sort of information, but none of them were told. So immediately after the newspaper ran these stories, many people on these congressional committees received classified briefings about UFOs. And of course, um, there are one or two video clips of these people being asked about this because this was a, an extraordinary story. The media, when they ran stories about UFOs before this, they tended to run stories where they made a joke about it and they, they made references to the X-Files or, or to um, uh, all sorts of Hollywood films. But now in the media, the defense and national security journalists were getting involved and they were the ones doing the interviews and having to learn very rapidly about this subject, which previously had just been something to make a joke about. So they asked some of the people, what, what was in the briefing? And of course the, the, congressional representatives came out of these briefings. They looked very serious and they said, the information about UFOs is very interesting, but I can't discuss it because it is, 
it is highly classified. But some of them went on to make speculative remarks and said, hypothetically, if you were to ask me whether or not we are alone in the universe, I would say no. Is this just a personal opinion or are some of them trying to give us subtle clues? I do not know the answer to that question, but uh, I want to discuss two more important developments before I finish and before we take some questions. Uh, the, the first development is that uh, last summer, the United States government tried to sum up a lot of what I have talked about in this presentation by releasing a report to Congress uh, giving their preliminary assessment. And what is interesting about this report is that it did not come from the Department of Defense, although, of course, they were consulted. It came from the Director of National Intelligence. And uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence exists to coordinate intelligence advice to the president uh, and, and to other decision makers from across all 18 uh, agencies in the United States that are involved with intelligence, uh, the CIA, uh, the National Security Agency, the, all, all those different organizations. The director of national intelligence coordinates all this intelligence information. And they produced a report and a nine page unclassified version of this report was published and you can read it on their website. It was dated 25th of June last year. And it's very interesting. It, it says this is not a definitive assessment because we do not yet have enough data, but it is a preliminary assessment of the UFO phenomenon based on an in-depth study of 144 cases, uh, military cases that we looked at since 2004. And of those 144 cases, um, 143 remained unexplained. So they said this, this may simply be because we are not looking at the data properly. We may need to refine the way in which we look, but but what was important was that this report stated these UFOs, we are not just talking about visual sightings. We are talking about UFOs that are simultaneously uh, witnessed on multiple different platforms. So visual, radar, forward-looking infrared camera, electro-optical, uh, weapon seeker, a lot of very technical things. But the important point is that a lot of these sightings appear on several of these at the same time. So even if you are skeptical and you say, well, maybe there was a, a fault with the radar, these things happen. Yes, but at the same time, uh, we have the infrared cameras working. And at the same time, we have other technical, sometimes classified ways of looking at data. Uh, there was an interview from, uh, I, I mentioned the director of national intelligence. 
the current director of national intelligence is Avril Haines. Uh, so she is responsible for this work now. The previous director was John Ratcliffe. And John Ratcliffe, after he left this position, he was interviewed on television about UFOs. And he made a very revealing comment. And he said, what's interesting about these sightings, he said, it's not just uh, a sighting from a pilot or something tracked on satellite. And everyone who was watching that interview stopped with disbelief because this was the first time that anyone had mentioned that UFOs were being tracked on military satellites. So, of course, this was another clue, I think, another piece of the puzzle. And, and it's interesting, all these characters, all these, you can, like a, a puzzle where you try to put the pieces together, sometimes look at the, the different personalities involved. There was an event held at Washington National Cathedral uh, a couple of months ago. And people gave, it was a moderated discussion about space. And what was interesting is that this discussion brought together a number of different people, but including Avril Haines, the current director of national intelligence, Bill Nelson, the current head of NASA, and uh, Professor Avi Loeb from the Galileo Project at Harvard, and also a, a theologian, uh, John Wilkinson, Wilkerson, to, to talk about the theological implications of discovering extraterrestrial life. The fact that these discussions are going on at all is, I think, extremely important and telling. And it, it shows a fundamental shift in the way in which this subject has been discussed in recent years. And a final, a final development in all of this is that at the end of last year, uh, President Biden signed the big new uh, defense bill. Once a year, uh, each year, there is a big defense authorization act. And this is where Congress uh, produces the legislation setting out its requirements, all the different things that I mentioned, that they would hold the government, the military, the intelligence agencies, hold them to account on accountability. And within the confines of classified information, openness and transparency. Um, there are, of course, limits on that. Um, but when we talk about classified information, but as I said earlier, even those classified programs, uh, they cannot be illegal programs. They, they must be properly authorized and uh, there must be proper scrutiny of these programs. And so that's what's happening now. And the interesting development was that into this new defense bill, which, which again is, it, none of this is secret. It's all I, the nine page report you can read on the website. This new legislation is on the website. Um, I can send links afterwards perhaps uh, for those of you who, who want to see this information and check that this information is indeed 
on these government websites. It's no good having this information on UFO websites, even though, of course, all the UFO enthusiasts put it there. To, to be assured that this comes from a legitimate source, it is important to, to read these documents on the original government website. So when, when you see the, the videos, the UFO videos, uh, see them on the US Navy website. When you read this legislation, see it on the website of the United States Congress. When you read this intelligence report, read it on the Office of the Director of National Intelligence website. So, uh, of course, so that you can be assured that this is genuine information. And you will see in this new bill that there are multiple provisions about UAPs. And this details all the different aspects of the phenomenon on which Congress now wants reports. So they want, and they want uh, an annual report that will be unclassified, that the media and the public can see, and they want more frequent classified reports so that there can be proper accountability. And you will see all the different areas they list in which they are interested. So, for example, uh, if there is a report of UAP activity around any nuclear facility, this must be detailed. Um, they also want to be assured that there is proper coordination. One of the big failings of intelligence on any subject, not just UFOs, one of the traditional areas in which government fails is poor sharing of information between all the different parts of the military and all the different intelligence agencies. Uh, this can be simple rivalry between the Air Force and the Army and the Navy, or it can be with highly classified programs that the different agencies are very reluctant to share information, even, even with their, their own government, because there is there is an obsession with secrecy and high classification. But of course, if you share your intelligence with no one, you might as well not have that intelligence. That's why we use the phrase actionable intelligence. Uh, intelligence only becomes useful if you can take action on it and receive a particular outcome. So for the first time in the annual National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022, we now have two pages of that legislation talks about UFOs, UAPs. So this is the changed situation in which we now find ourselves. And um, in, in a, a moment, I will conclude my remarks and perhaps we can take some, some questions and have a, a discussion. But in, in concluding, I would, I would say this. The last few years have marked a fundamental shift in the way in which this subject is viewed, not just by the media and the public, but within government politically, for the first time, certainly in the United States, um, people in Congress are now taking this subject seriously and receiving classified briefings on it and writing this into the new pieces of legislation. I do not know what is happening in other countries. I do not know, for example, what the United Kingdom, what Poland, uh, what other nations are doing.
but it will not have escaped the attention of people in the Polish military, uh, the British military, that these things are happening. So it may be that this has not been discussed yet, and it may be that some of the information is classified, but in Poland, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany, in, in many other countries, people will be watching what has happened in the United States, and people will be asking their own uh, minister of defense, their own director of national intelligence, what do we know about this subject? What are our own Air Force pilots seeing? What are our radar operators tracking? So this, this has been a, a fundamental change in the way in which this subject has, has been treated, as I say. And I do not know what the outcome of this is going to be. But what I do know is that uh, the next few years are going to be very interesting because a lot of people are suddenly realizing that this subject, which they had ignored, is now a subject that must be viewed with interest. And I do not know, of course, I am not one of these people that claims to have the answer to the UFO mystery. In fact, the report that I mentioned said there is unlikely to be one single answer to this. There may be many different things going on. Some of this technology may well be secret prototype aircraft, missiles, and drones, but some of it may be something else. And if there's anything unidentified in your airspace, and of course, in these tragic times, um, anything in, in Polish airspace, in, in British airspace, is of even more interest and importance than it ever was. So that we can say, is this, is this technology from our own Air Force, some of our own classified programs? Is it something from Russia? Or is it something else? We don't know the answers to those questions, but current events tell us that it is more important than it has ever been to look at these questions and to find the answers to those questions using the military resources at our disposal, using the scientific tools and expertise that we have, because whatever the true nature of the UFO phenomenon, there is now no doubt that it is a defense and national security issue. Thank you very much. Oh my, oh my, Nick, thank you for providing this, uh, this picture that really, you know, stimulates our, our imagination. Well, there's, there's something going on, that's, that's for sure. Uh, I, have to, I have to admit that, you know, after many years of reading scientific astrophysical literature and under the influence of such people as you, Nick, uh, now I'm prone to, you know, admit, uh, paraphrasing the, the, the book title of, uh, of Professor Cross, that there is rather something than nothing. And uh, yeah, well, forgive me if I missed it, but uh, what actually uh, changed your mind, your, your general attitude towards UFO related issues, you know, back in 1990s? Uh, so you became a leading, you know, popularizer and, and public expert uh, in these matters, but also a, a mid-buster. Yes, I think that going back to my time doing this job, and uh, I should make it clear, by the way, that really the only reason that I can discuss this is because the British government itself 
declassified and released a lot of the UFO files and sent them to the National Archives. And uh, in fact, they asked me to, to come back and make a, a promotional video for them to publicize that. Uh, but of course, uh, sometimes people say, well, how, how is he able to discuss this because of, of secrecy? Laws. Right. So the the answer to that question is because the Ministry of Defense released many of the files that that I wrote, and and I felt this subject was too interesting and too important to to walk away from. And and as you say, I now see my role as as maybe a, a communicator All on right. this mm -hmm. this subject. But to to answer your question. There was a particular case I, I had in 1993 where over a period of six hours in the United Kingdom, there were dozens of different UFO reports coming in, often reporting a large triangular shaped craft capable of moving from a, a very slow speed of maybe 30 or 40 miles an hour, uh, and suddenly accelerating away to the horizon in just a split second. And these estimates very often came from military witnesses who, who uh, at least two Air Force bases were overflown by, by this object. So, so many of the witnesses were used to seeing uh, military aircraft and helicopters. And so uh, while no witness is perfect, they had a very good estimate, a very good judge of speed and acceleration, for example. And these these were the sorts of witnesses making these these assessments. And um, we we had some some radar data, but it was inconclusive. Uh, but multiple military witnesses and police witnesses, and we la launched a full investigation, and uh, we we did not we did not come up with anything. We and and it raises an interesting question because I suppose the question is how could you ever be one hundred percent sure that what you were looking at was not some secret prototype um, drone from maybe the United States or, or China or Russia. How could you differentiate between that and something extraterrestrial if all you had was radar data? Um, because whatever these things are, they must operate within the laws of physics. Uh, and so um, I mentioned Professor Avi Loeb and, and Galileo Project. He says we must look at UFOs. This is important, but we must look at it within the confines of the laws of physics. We, we cannot say, oh, they come here with their anti-gravity and their, you, you know, we, we must look only at right. data from within the standard model. So... Uh, it, it is an interesting dilemma, and, and I don't have an answer to the question, but, uh, but this, these were the sorts of cases that made me uh, pay more attention to this and say there, there may be something more interesting. It's not just aircraft lights and weather balloons and things like mm -hmm. that. Right. Uh, thank you, Nick. And uh, how would you assess the, the, the state of, of public debate on UFOs and extraterrestrial life, uh, you know, in USA? Because to be honest, I have a feeling of, of, of some kind of uh, chaos, actually. And there's uh, probably a lot of bad blood between the UFO hyper enthusiasts and, and the skeptics. Yes, it's an interesting question because for, for many years, the UFO community uh, accused the government 
of covering up the truth about UFOs. And um, in, in now, some of these people believe literally there are crashed alien spaceships and and alien bodies being kept at F Area Fifty One or wherever. I I don't I don't believe that. But but the conspiracy when when people accuse the United States government of not telling the truth about UFOs. In one sense, of course, they were correct because the, 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 this program, these videos, had not had not been made public, and and yet they existed. So, so in one sense, part of the conspiracy or the theory was was correct. There really was a a program looking at this, and there was information about UFOs. Now, it was not the information that that the UFO community thought exists. So, so now we have a difficult situation because on the one hand, the, the UFO believers uh, welcome these new developments, but on the other hand, they still don't believe the government. They still think um, right. that maybe there are other things that they are not admitting to, uh, the skeptics are in a diff difficult position as well, because the skeptics for years said, this is crazy. All these conspiracies are wrong. Of course, there isn't a government program looking at this. And now they have had to admit that, well, part of it, they were right. So we are in a state of uh, confusion at at the moment, but at least there is now maybe a more informed debate going on. And I mentioned one of the interesting developments is that now when there's a UFO story in a newspaper, it's very likely that it will be the defense journalist, the military journalist, the same journalist that writes the stories on the war in Ukraine will be writing the stories on UFOs. So this is, is a new development. But the, the debate, of, of course, still continues. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I have recently watched the documentary by uh, Mark Monroe. Uh, that documentary uh, is entitled just The UFO, I think. And the experts and the director himself uh, claimed in this uh, in this documentary that you know the whole UFO phenomenon is a part of uh, some kind of uh, uh, disinformation policy, disinformation process conducted by the U.S. Uh, government, and of course they presented some interesting you know evidence uh, to support their their claims, but. Still, I would like to ask you, how would you respond to, to such theses? I think that some of that is correct. Historically, for example, we know that when uh, spy planes like the U-2 and uh, the SR-71 Blackbird, when they were seen sometimes by uh, commercial airline pilots, in the 50s and the 60s, it was very useful for the CIA and for the United States Air Force if these ran as stories about UFOs. If, and so sometimes the government, sometimes they would be pleased if the story ran as a story about flying saucers and not spy planes. And sometimes maybe they went a step further and promoted belief in UFOs as a way to cover uh, some of their prototype spy plane programs. But now that may explain some of the information, but I'm not sure that it explains all of the information. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, maybe let's sort things out. Uh, 
when it comes to uh, UFOs, what are the verifiable assumptions? What are the reasonable interpretations? Uh, what is a pure speculation? And what are the facts? Well, the facts are the data. And those data may be uh, photographs or videos. They may be uh, radar recordings. Uh, there, is, there is a whole um, field of intelligence called MASINT, which stands for Measurement and Signature Intelligence. And this, for example, is if you were to film uh, a military aircraft from behind, for example, uh, you, you would see the engines, you would see the afterburners, you could do all sorts of uh, spectral analysis, uh, the, all, the full details are, of course, classified, but, but to summarize, um, if, if you had a film of an aircraft, you could immediately probably tell that aircraft type. You you could probably say, is this is this a MiG twenty nine or is it a an F F thirty five? Each engine produces a, a unique signature. There are other things. So these this field of intelligence work called MASINT is central to this. So those are the data that we have. Uh, satellite images as well. I, I, I mentioned that the former director of national intelligence um, let that slip in a TV interview. So those are the data. The interpretations are more subjective, mm. uh, particularly where it, it's, it's easy. If, if the data match, something in your database, of course, that's easy. It's not um, easy. Right. Yeah. The problem, the problem is when they don't, and that is when you have to go into speculation. So right. the speculation, of course, is, is basically, there are about, I suppose, four different theories. Um, the first theory is that however unlikely it is that all these things would happen at once, uh, but maybe there is a fault with the camera, interference with the radar, um, the eyewitness testimony is a misidentification. All these things happen at once. And so one interpretation, one theory is that this is all just ordinary objects, but distorted somehow. Mm -hmm. The second theory is that it is our own technology, that somewhere in the United States government, or maybe one of the defense contractors, somebody is secretly testing something. And a, a blind test, uh, maybe the, the Air Force is secretly testing the Navy to see... Um, does our new drone show up on radar? If it does, how quickly will they get jets to intercept us? Will they be able to catch us? Now, I think this is unlikely because these sorts of blind tests happen. But afterwards, particularly when Congress is, is involved, people would say, OK, don't worry about this. We can't tell you the details, but, but we know about this. <laughs> this is not happening, but mm. we cannot rule out the possibility. So the second theory is that it is our own technology. The third theory is that it is adversarial technology, probably Russia or China, but maybe mm. another nation. And the fourth theory is that it is something completely unknown. And of course, everyone has their different theories. Some people say 
extraterrestrials. Some people say time travelers from the future. Some people say oh, inter interdimensional. Some people even say they look at this as, as religious and they say it's demonic. I, all of those, all those theories, there are people out there who believe <laughs> these different theories. I, I take no position on it. I, well, I said, actually, I believe Kip Thorne. <laughs> it might be possible. Yes. Sorry for interruption. No, I, 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 had, I had finished that thought. I, and, and, and absolutely, who, who knows what is possible? But this, this is why we need more data and we need more analysis of the data that we already have. Mm -hmm. Right, and when it comes to data and when it comes to the facts, um, could you please explain us what happened in Rendlesham Forest on December 26, 1980? Certainly, it's this, quite an this, interesting story. Oh, uh, this, I, uh, well, uh, do we have another three hours? No. <laughs> this is, Maybe this an hour. is. Uh, this is a this is a very complex story, but it is it is Britain's best known and best evidenced UFO incident. Uh, Described by you uh, in your book. Yes, I, I I wrote a book with two of the main military witnesses, and uh, there were UFO sightings over three consecutive nights in December 1980 at two Air Force bases in the United Kingdom, but operated by the United States. And on the first night, a small metallic object of some sort, about nine feet across, landed in a clearing in Rendlesham Forest which is close to these two military bases. And then it took off again vertically and accelerated at high speed. And there was subsequently uh, an examination of the landing site. And again, there, there are documents, declassified UK Ministry of Defense documents saying that the levels of radioactivity taken at at that location seemed significantly higher than the average background radiation. Uh, there, there were no further landings, but there were sightings over the next two nights. And on the third night, the witnesses included the deputy base commander who had been very annoyed by all this talk about UFOs, he felt that it was interfering with the primary mission, and he wanted to dispel all the rumors. And then he was told that the UFO had come back. So he went out into the forest with a small team, determined to debunk these rumors, and he saw the UFO himself. And, and at one point, it fired a beam of light down, lighting up the ground in front of him and his, his men. And, and he asked himself later, was, was this a weapon? Was this a warning? Was it communication? He didn't know. And to this day, when you ask him what it was, he says, I don't know. But whatever it was, it was under intelligent control. So again, of course, we, we have exactly the same debate that, that we're having about some of these modern sightings. Is Could this be some secret prototype aircraft or drone? Or is it something else? This, this event is now 40 years in the past, and we still don't know. We, mm -hmm. we probably never will know. Mm -hmm. Oh my, that's the story. Uh, well, uh, let me ask uh, just just another uh, the, the 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 last question. 
uh, about science, actually. Uh, well, scientists are truly strongly engaged in uh, both speculating and searching empirically for any traces of, you know, extraterrestrial life. Uh, and we are still developing studies on the uh, politics of outer space. And at the same time, I, I feel that we tend to, uh, to to negate the reasonability of of incorporating uh, so-called you know extraterrestrial studies to the field of social science and humanities, uh, treating such possibility as a symptom of, let's say, a, a fringeness, right? And uh, inconsistency here. Uh, in the in the realm of, of of science is is quite obvious here. And how do you think? Is there any space for such serious, uh, groundbreaking, uh, interdisciplinary research that won't be refused as an unscientific and odd and and fringe and that kind of things? How do you think? It's a very interesting and important question. A few years ago, I think the the answer would be that it it would not happen, and mm -hmm. um, because yeah, so, you okay. in, in your question, I think you articulated very well the problem, because mm -hmm. people traditionally asked, well, what do scientists think about UFOs? Mm -hmm. But that. The, the response to that question is, well, which scientists, where does this subject fit in the scientific world? Does it, is it astronomy? Is it astrophysics? Is it sociology? Um, is it where, which scientists should be looking at this? And it depends, of course, um, on which data you have. I think there are two answers to your question, and or rather, there are two ways in which things are changing. Firstly, under the umbrella of the term astrobiology, mm -hmm. people are now looking at the scientific search for alien life. I acknowledge that there is a difference between looking for life out there in the universe and looking for it down here, but this is where mm -hmm. this, the two subjects will meet. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, many scientists are complete uh, believers in extraterrestrial life elsewhere in the universe and complete skeptics about UFOs, but I think that view is changing. And I think the view is now, let's not rule out any of these possibilities. And if we have data, let's not ignore that. So that's why it was very interesting. I mentioned this event where Bill Nelson, the, the head of NASA, um, spoke about this. And, and he, he gave an interview before before this, and it's very revealing the way in which he he talks about this in, in relation not just to looking, for example, with the James Webb Space Telescope, but looking at UAP data as well. So I think now that under the umbrella of the term astrobiology, there is a way that people are going to say, and let's look at the UAP data too, as part of this. This will happen, I think, to some extent in NASA, but I've mentioned a couple of times the Galileo project, and I think this is the real answer to the question. It will come from the scientists themselves, because Avi Loeb is an astrophysicist, but if you look at the Galileo project website and the research team, you will see uh, a, a much more multidisciplinary team mm -hmm. beginning to come together. Uh, and, and indeed, some of the people on the Galileo project are not scientists at all. I am a, I, I'm a research affiliate there myself. But the main science team 
uh, like I say, it's not just astrophysicists. It's, it's very mm -hmm. multidisciplinary. And that enables science to address the question of where in science does UAP fit? And I think the answer is in many different parts. And you will see this reflected in the Galileo project, and you will see it reflected in organizations like the SETI Institute, uh, where some of their post-detection work includes not, not just the, the hard sciences like astrophysics and, and cosmology, but, but, you know, I mean, some of the scientific conferences on this uh, include now uh, social scientists, political scientists, sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, theologians, mm -hmm. because if we do discover extraterrestrial life, there will be implications for almost every field of science and almost every aspect of society, whether it's politics, religion, the economy, science, technology, philosophy, everything. So this is mm -hmm. why multidisciplinary approaches are the answer to this. Right. Uh, what you have just said is absolutely in, li uh, in line with, with my point of view. Actually, uh, I must mention about it. Uh, in my uh, uh, article, we are uh, preparing with uh, Professor Jonathan Jiang from from NASA, actually. So, so yeah, uh, guys, do you have any questions to our guest? Because we are, you know, uh, conducting a dialogue here, and uh, I would like to ask you if you have any questions. Uh, we can also unmute you. We can uh, uh, turn on your cameras if you have. Uh, uh, this kind of things. So how about you? Okay, guys, if there are no questions, uh, I have to, I just have to end. No, we have a question from our friend Agata Krzywdzińska. Uh, I want to say that the Ancient Aliens program is my favorite TV program. <laughs> Here you have, Nick. Uh, well, have, you observed, have you observed any increased UFO activity in connection with the war in Ukraine in the last two weeks? Oh, my. Um, yes. Um, the, the, unfortunately, of course, uh, amidst the tragedy of war, and particularly war in our modern multimedia society, it's, it's inevitable that there will be many, many different people taking videos with their cell phones. And the UFO community, of course, looks at these and, and sometimes they, they say, hey, th what is this light or what is this? And, and unfortunately, of course, most of the the time, the answer is it's probably a missile or a flare. I, I mean, I think it's very difficult with these videos. Firstly, we can't be 100% sure of the authenticity of, of the, the videos themselves. And secondly, in a confused situation of literal war, people are firing missiles, uh, aircraft are dropping flares to, to try to um, send these heat-seeking missiles off target. Uh, there are many, many different things in the skies. So yes, I have seen some reports, but but it is very likely that we are just looking at military activity here. But um, of, of course, you know the stories will will continue. And and thank you, by the way, for the comment about ancient aliens. I I will not. I I think it's maybe not the most science based program on the subject out there, but I think it's. It asks an interesting question, and I think you know, to ask the question, what if, or could it be, um, is interesting and fun. And uh, I, I think it's, it's a show that has great popular appeal. It doesn't pretend to be you know, all about hard physics and 
Of course not. But but it brings the subject to a very wide audience. And I think anything that does that is a good thing. And plus, it's a it's a fun show to be on. Oh, that's that's for sure. Uh, so the conclusion is that we have to stay open minded. That's yes, we Avi Loeb was asked about this and I, I may be misquoting him, but uh, he, he said something like, uh, we will set up telescopes and we will see what our telescopes find. He said, our telescopes do not have opinions, uh, but they will find data and we can then analyze those data using the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Right, guys, any more questions? Well then, Nick, uh, thank you so much. Uh, many thanks, my true sympathy for you. Uh, thank you that you uh, decided to, to, to be here with us today uh, at the morning hours, actually. <laughs> well, it's, thank it's, you, it's thank you. Important. Yes, thank you very much for hosting this event, for organizing yeah. it, and thank you uh, to all of you who who came today to to listen and watch, um, uh, as I say, I, perhaps I I will send uh, the links to some of these these documents if if uh, you're interested in seeing these on the the original government websites. But I, I hope you found it uh, interesting. And uh, whatever your opinions on this subject, I think it's a question. It's a, a subject that inspires a lot of uh, interest, discussion, and debate, and that is always a good thing. Absolutely, I fully, I fully agree. So, guys, thank you very much for your attendance, Nick. Thank you very much for your lecture, for your, uh, you know, uh, uh, our dialogue. Uh, and well, see you soon, guys. Uh, see you on March uh, 23, I think. Uh, our guest is going to be uh, Professor Robert Cohen. So see you in a few days' time. Nick, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much.